welcome to this edition of Interviews to Suit with your host, W. Dennis Suit. This week's guest is Carrollton educator and businessman Jim Naughton, who is running for the hotly contested District 30 seat in the Georgia State Senate. Today we welcome Jim Naughton, who is running for the District 30 Senate, Georgia Senate seat. Thank you. Jim, if I may call you Jim. Sure can, uh, Dennis. I see you were born in New York, went to high school there, and or earned a bachelor's degree in business administration. I did indeed. You did indeed. Uh, I understand you call home Carrollton home? Yes, Carrollton's home for Laura and I and our three uh, young daughters. Okay, you have three young daughters. Yes, I do, yeah. How did you meet her? Actually, Laura and I met on an airplane. Uh, we were both on a uh, Delta flight back from Paris to New York. Laura was working in uh, France at the time, and I was over for a uh, trade show in, uh, in France, and so we were seated together. Laura was coming back to attend her brother Roy's wedding, uh, which took place at uh, St. John the Divine in New York, and we were seated together for uh, a nice eight-hour flight and got to know one another. We realized we had a lot in common. We're both from large families. Uh, and that was in 1999, and you know, fell in love, got married in 2001 down at uh, Christ Church on St. Simon's Island. And, mm -hmm. and the rest uh, is so how old are your daughters? Uh, our daughters are, we have a 10-year-old Alice named after Laura's mom. We have an 8-year-old Fiona, and then we have a 5-year-old Maria. So we have uh, uh, lots of pretty young ladies in our house. Well, I'm sure you do, and I'm sure they're all gorgeous. Thank you. And. Uh, uh, I understand you're, not only do you have a Republican background, but your wife is also from a large Republican uh, background. Yes, she is. So I guess two, I guess two, two Republican backgrounds got married there. Uh, yes, that's the case. We, uh, you know, Laura's dad, Roy, started Southwire 63 years ago and uh, was a Republican when there weren't too many Republicans in the state. Um, um, my f and but like a lot of big families, there's people on both sides of the aisle. Um, Laura's one of seven. I'm one of ten. Um, I actually came of age to vote in the presidential election in, of 1980. Uh, and that was a race between Jimmy Carter and uh, Ronald Re uh, Ronald Reagan. And, and Mr. Carter talked about um, you know an American malaise, and he talked about uh, some of the issues we were facing at that time. I had started working for Millican and Company in a financial job. The prime interest rate was about 22 percent, and so if you could borrow, it was 24, 25, 26 percent. And because of that, the economy was really struggling. And so that was a choice with a fellow named Ronald Reagan who talked about America, the shiny city on the hill where all things were possible and the next generation can do better than the previous one. And so I registered as a Republican, voted for Ronald Reagan, mm -hmm. and uh, the rest is kind of history. But having said that, I, I, I'm a bit of an open-minded, independent Republican. Uh, I've made choices based more or less on um, the attributes of the candidate, not necessarily strictly party affiliation, uh, having voted largely Republican. Um, but I, I still make it my choice every year, one candidate at a time. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about me. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, why did you decide to get in politics? Well, um, I've always been interested in politics. Um, and I guess that goes back to my long history at Milliken and Company. Uh, Roger Milliken was a staunch Republican who uh, believed that the political process was also part of the business process. For businesses to be successful, they needed to be attuned and engaged in politics. Uh, Mr. Milliken was uh, a real leader uh, in the Republican Party. He attended the National Convention for most of his life. Uh, he died in, uh, two years ago at the age of, 19, uh, at the age of 95. Um, and every year he had what was called the Spring Fling and that was at the corporate facilities in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And one of the weekend days was a political day, and all of the leadership of um, the states of primarily North Carolina and uh, South Carolina and Georgia, actually North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia were invited because we had significant operations. Some of our 60 textile plants were mostly located mm -hmm. in those three states. So I got to meet, you know, Strom Thurmond and Fritz Hollings mm -hmm. and all the guys in the House and Governor Campbell and you know, the guys in the Georgia delegation, uh, 
mm -hmm. Speaker Gingrich. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just a great environment. Uh, we during that time we went through a lot of different issues. We we saw NAFTA come into effect and have a fairly significant impact on the American textile and apparel industries. Um, so it really goes back to Roger Milliken, who stressed that uh, the political process was part mm -hmm. of the business process. Also, uh, every management associate at Milliken went through an orientation program, uh, typically about nine weeks long. But one of the weeks was something called Freedom School. And Freedom School was uh, a week-long class in libertarianism. Mm -hmm. uh, Roger Milliken wanted all of his uh, business associates, all of the management associates of the company, to be able to think and think politically and understand how politics were part of the process and that we needed to be engaged. So because of that, because of the great DNA that Roger Milliken instilled in me, uh, I've always had an interest in politics and, and been a bit of an armchair pundit even though uh, I was a businessman mm -hmm. through and through. You know, jumping ahead to, to living in Georgia, uh, we got involved in some of the political races. Um, we looked at some of the little, the local stuff, and about a year ago, uh, you know, I said if the opportunity to ever present itself where I could serve and make a difference, uh, you know, more immediately, mm -hmm. I, I would take that chance. And Laura and I talked about it and prayed about it and talked with all of our family members. And received real encouragement that if the right opportunity were to come about, that uh, you know I should go for it. And so, as you know, this seat opened up about oh, I think it's only about four or five weeks ago. It seems a lot longer uh, when uh, Bill Hamrick received a judicial appointment, and uh, you know I, I I jumped in. But having said that, I had done a lot of groundwork going back to the spring um, about possibly doing something like this. And the reason I'm running is, um, you know, I think there are some real issues that we talk about, but we really don't do much about. Uh, I think part of our political atmosphere is to talk and not to do things. And so it's more or less been a situation where I think mm -hmm. it's business as usual. We talk about these issues at, during the campaign season, but then we don't really do much about it. Uh, and so part of it is real frustration that we're not tackling some of these issues that need to be tackled. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't do things halfway at Milliken and Company. Roger Milliken gave you a lot of responsibility and expected you to do it well. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, this is something I, I want to jump into and, and hopefully have an impact so that we can create a better environment for Georgia, not just for my children, but for all of the children mm -hmm. so that they can stay in the state, have economic opportunity, and hopefully do better. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we have an old saying in the South, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that, that mothers tell their daughters when, when they're young. It, I'm deep South, you know. Uh, for God's sakes, don't marry a Catholic, and don't marry a Yankee. Oh, there you go. Well, we see you're a Yankee, but I think since you're such a good republic, we can probably forgive you for that. There you go. We'll give you a visa sooner or later. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, uh, I am not Southern by birth, but I am Southern by choice. Mm -hmm. uh, at Milliken & Company, corporate headquarters was Spartanburg, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, the company moved me around with uh, all of the different promotions I received in my career. I spent a lot of time in, in Greenville, Spartanburg. Got to see a lot of great things. Mm -hmm. My first job with Milliken was uh, in their credit department, and I actually my I supported uh, all of the sales efforts throughout the Southeast. I had that territory. I supported the business unit, and I supported the sales reps, and got to know. Part of the process was to travel through the South and meet the the small mom and pop retailers mm -hmm. uh, to extend credit to keep them in business. Uh, we looked at companies' financial issues, but a big part of credit was character. Are you all right? Yeah, you're fine. Uh, collar. A yeah. big part of uh, credit was character, and so we would meet the owners of these small institutions, these small mm -hmm. uh, enterprises. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I tr I've traveled through the South uh, now since, since 1981, so um, I'm Southern by choice. Um, I, there's a lot mm -hmm. of great things down here. Mm -hmm. Um, Laura and I moved back to Carrollton uh, three years ago. My wife was born, or, born and raised in Carrollton. And we traveled a lot. We had an international posting in London. And uh, she, said, she said then that London reminded her a lot of Carrollton, 
not a big city comparison to Carrollton, but the people there still have incredible manners. Uh, politeness is a, yes. a big part of their culture. And that reminded Laura of growing up in Carrollton where people were nice to one another and you know mm -hmm. people held doors and people said yes sir and yes ma'am or no ma'am. And, and we saw that in London and that really resonated with Laura mm -hmm. and with me as well. I, I mean, I had seen that through my 30 years of traveling through the South. Uh, and we moved back because, you know, she really wanted to return home after her mom passed away. Um, her mom was a big part of um, Carrollton's conscience, and her mom did lots of good things there, uh, and instilled those great values in Laura and her six siblings. Mm -hmm. And Laura wanted to move back to not necessarily assume her mom's place, but to, to try to do the same good works that her mom did. Mm -hmm. And also to present a real visible example of the family values that are present in mm -hmm. Southwire. So that the Southwire associates could see that you know, the family really cares mm -hmm. not just about the company, but also about the community. And, and Southwire makes a real effort to, to be focused on the community. Mm -hmm. They voluntarily, the men and women of Southwire have created a, uh, something called the, the Black Shirt Fund. And that's where they voluntarily contribute so that if there is an emergency within a family group within Southwire, whether someone's house burns down or, or it's destroyed in a tornado or, or something like that, they have the funds and the resources and the, the manpower to go and make a difference. So, so it's important to us to be part of the community. Well, anybody that's lived in this part of the world knows how important Southwire has been to it. I'm sure that uh, they probably funded my it funds to my father. I have to go back and look at his campaign records, but I'm pretty sure that he probably got funds from them. And uh, we got Coke and all, you know, the all the traditional, the Blue Brothers. Everybody traditionally donates to the Republican candidates. And, uh, but um, so, what's your? You said something when we were talking earlier that your one of your big emphasis was education. Yeah. Uh, my parents immigrated to this country. Uh, they both grew up on family farms. Uh, most of my parents were born and raised in Ireland. Uh, my dad is one of 11. Uh, my mom is one of six. Um, and, you know, that was a culture that was agricultural through and through in that day and age. And there wasn't much of an economy outside of agriculture. Uh, you know, very paternalistic. So the family farm was going to go to the oldest son. And neither my mom nor my dad were the oldest sons in their family. So they made their way out into the world to find economic opportunity. My dad left his home when he was 14. My mom left her home when she was 16. And ultimately, they, they both ended up in New York. They met each other, fell in love, got married, and then started a family. I have nine brothers and sisters. That's a big family. Uh, but having said, when my parents left their home, they both left home with essentially a primary or, or elementary school education, not much more than that. And they understood the value of education, that they understood that education was the surest path out of poverty. And so my parents scrimped and saved to put us all through, um, I'll say, faith-based education. So, you know, going back to your comment, we all went to Catholic schools. And, you know, we, we had an education system that was grounded in faith. Uh, but that's, you know, that was really foundational to who, who all we were and who all we were going to be. Um, and so I went on to college, most of my brothers and sisters, not all of them went on to college. Uh, they all have done very, very well and pursued the American dream and my parents who are both alive, my dad is, uh, my dad's 86, my mom is gonna turn 80 on election day. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, both of them are very proud of what their children have uh, accomplished. I, I have an older brother who's a doctor, we have mm -hmm. teachers, we have nurses, we have IT professionals, we have an architect. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, education is important, and it's important to our family success story, but it's important to everybody's family success story. It's important to the Richards. I mean, Mr. Richards came out of Georgia Tech and start, started Southwire. Mm -hmm. He couldn't have done that without the great education he received in Southwire. And he put himself through school. He worked. He first started Berry College, which was then not a college. And then he ended up at uh, what was West Georgia A&M and uh, became University of West Georgia. And then he did his last two years at Tech. So he knew the value of education. 
um, I mean, education is a, is a priority for Laura and I. Uh, I. I got involved in the University of West Georgia to try to raise funds for their nursing program and to try to help keep the young men and women in college. Uh, I think the number one dropout rate issue for our people at the college level in the state is financing and uh, you know, having the ability to stay in school. But we have an issue at the K through 12 um, level as well. I mean, we have a very significant dropout rate. Yes, we do. Uh, you know, we're not educating our young people in alignment with what the needs of the global economy are. Um, you know, talking about education, we did live abroad. We lived in the United Kingdom. We lived in England for five years. And uh, we were able to see a couple of different concrete examples of different approaches. England is the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, and somewhere in the last 50 years, they de-emphasized manufacturing as a viable way of life or something that people should aspire to be in. They de-emphasized uh, apprenticeship. They de-emphasized the technical schools, the trade schools. And so today, England gets about 6% of its GDP from what are manufacturing jobs. Uh, I got to spend a lot of time in Germany working on a project. Uh, Germany took a different track. Germany has a university track, but they have an, an industrial uh, manufacturing track, technical, high-precision industrial manufacturing track. And, and that's a real attractive option for people who aren't interested in the university track. And, and it's the technical skills to run the high-tech equipment that the whole world is buying. In, uh, the German economy didn't slow down in this economic crisis. It slowed down a little, but their unemployment rate is close to 4%. And I was just reading an article recently that the people who are going through the industrial track are graduating from that track and, and, and having a choice of three or four really good jobs, mm -hmm. jobs that pay the American equivalent of 50 or 60 or $70,000 a year, mm -hmm. jobs that allow you four weeks vacation, mm -hmm. jobs that allow you to go on vacation, to nice places because you have money in your pocket. And I think that's a, a little bit of a disconnect here. I mean, we have a technical... Yeah, I was going to ask you, excuse me, I was going to ask you about how you're feeling about the technical schools. I think they're, we need to emphasize them more. I think you're exactly right. Uh, we, not everybody should go to university or has the desire to go to university. I think the technical track is a real viable option that may be somewhat out of line with what the needs are. I know we have a technical school here in uh, Paulding County, and we have West Georgia Tech in Carroll you County. A, you got one up in uh, up in Douglasville. Yeah, and so they're, they're there, but you know, are they are they really aligned with the needs of the business community? Well, uh, uh, you know, I'll talk specifically. There's a manufacturer in uh, Carroll County called Ditech, and they make precision parts, uh, and they employ uh, slightly more than 200 people now. And I was just visiting with them, and they cannot get people with the skills they need. They're actually hiring via a temp agency in Michigan, paying $50 an hour to the temp agency to get the skills they need. Um, you know, going back to Milliken and company, Roger Milliken was instrumental in helping to bring BMW to Greenville Spartanburg, to Greer, South Carolina. And at that point in time, and I was within the company, and, and I, I really saw the struggle firsthand, South Carolina was considered third on a list of three in the states that were competing for uh, that project with BMW for their North American facility. Mm -hmm. And South Carolina was considered third for two reasons. One, the, you, the education system. They didn't have a technical system that really aligned with what BMW's needs were. Mm -hmm. um, so that was their big hurdle. That, that was the number one reason that South Carolina was considered third in the long shot. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Milliken, talking about this alignment between the business community, the education community, and business, Mr. Milliken, who had political clout, you know, got Governor Campbell and got the people involved and said, we have to do something about this, and got the, the education system involved. And, mm -hmm. and they created an automotive track at Greenville Tech. Mm -hmm. And so today, not only did they get BMW, but if you go up that I-85 corridor mm -hmm. from Greenville to Spartanburg, it's just Pretty booming. Fun. And it's not just BMW, it's the Tier 1 and the Tier 2 and the Tier 3 suppliers. Mm -hmm. And again, going back to this, uh, you know, I was just talking to uh, Dr. Sullivan, and you know, Kia. We got Kia here, but you know, Kia is really struggling to find the people who have the skills and the inclination that they need, the work ethic that they need. 
and and the tier ones and the tier twos and the tier threes largely didn't follow Kia. You know, a lot of them, uh, you know, ended up establishing beachheads in Alabama across the state mm-hmm. line. So there's a real disconnect, I think, uh, between the business community, uh, between education community, and between the government community. I was in a meeting a, about a year and a half ago with uh, some folks at the University of West Georgia and Paul Bowers, the CEO of Georgia Power Southern Company. Our, our business leaders are all completely in tuned with how important the education process is and this disconnect. And, mm-hmm. you know, you, Paul Bowers, who is an incredibly accomplished, talented, visionary leader for Georgia Power and the Southern companies, I mean, he's on top of this issue and he, and he knows it's a real problem area for the state. Being a resident of Paulding County, I moved out here about four and a half years ago from the Vinings area. And um, it, it, it seems like to me our problem out here is lack of a, a, a interconnecting road network. In a, in a sense, you can say, well, great, Baldwin's great to live in, but you can't get there. <laughs> and uh, I've always felt like that may be one of our our, our handicaps in, in, associ- in, in attracting big businesses. I mean, uh, Coca-Cola or FedEx or you name them are not going to set up a, uh, uh, an operation at, the, at our great airport out here because there's no way to get there. Well, you're exactly right. Uh, I mean, that's another thing that businesses look at. They look at how easy it is to do business from a logistic point of view, from a traffic flow point of view, mm-hmm. from a moving goods and services around point of view. Mm-hmm. They really look at that, and mm-hmm. you're you're exactly right. We we voted down the T-plus, and that was probably appropriate because there was a real lack of transparency about the money in that mm-hmm. process. Mm-hmm. But transportation infrastructure is a critical component of attracting businesses and companies not just from neighboring states, but from around the world here. We have to make it easy to do business. I was talking, I went to the Chamber of Commerce meeting last week and I was talking with uh, uh, Mayor Devi and, and Mayor Boyd Austin about this. And I know that 70% of the workforce in Paulding County is commuting out of the county mm-hmm. and, and, and dealing with the issues of traffic and, you know, God forbid there's a, an accident or a, a storm, mm-hmm. the people who are commuting 50 minutes are suddenly facing a two-hour commute, yeah. which affects their quality mm-hmm. of life, which affects you know money in their mm-hmm. pocket. They, they're, you know, a mom and dad who are both working and commuting to Atlanta, you know, are, are ending up spending a little bit more on child mm-hmm. after-school child care, which you know takes money out of their pocket mm-hmm. for to have a family night yeah. out. You know, so it's a real issue, and and for the folks to say that they're going to work on attracting business here, but you know, don't want to talk about the hard questions of dealing with our infrastructure issues mm-hmm. and dealing with our education issue. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think they're just, they're kidding. They're kidding the constituents. They're just, mm-hmm. they're just not being honest and upfront. Um, how about health care in this area? We, uh, uh, Governor Obama and his plan, I don't mean bring it into a national level, but right. uh, we obviously, uh, I mean, w- uh, I, I see the, the need for to help a lot of people in this county in that area, uh, and you know, there's an argument. Well, you just don't, you can't get everybody on Medicaid, but I mean, there, there are people who desperately need it. Well, healthcare is uh, it's one of the big national issues, and it's also the big local issue. Mm-hmm. We do have an aging population, uh, and we do have a situation where healthcare costs have greatly exceeded the general inflation rate for the last 20 years. Our health care costs in some cases have tripled over the last you know, 15, 20, 30 years. It is a crisis point. Um, having said that, you know, the Affordable Health Care Act had some good things in it, had a lot of bad things in it. Um, I've talked to the medical community, I've talked to the insurance community. We do have to fix health care. Uh, my brother is a geriatric physician, He's, that's his specialty. Um, there's no easy answer. There's no good sound bite. It's another one of those things where we all have to roll up our sleeves and we have to come out with a solution that is affordable and appropriate to take care of our citizens. Mm-hmm. One of my pet peeves is the judicial versus non-judicial uh, uh, repossession. In the state, we can repossess houses. Bank can take your house any day they want to because we're non-judicial. Uh, uh, it's a non-judicial process. I mean, you might as well be 
I think uh, you might as well be have your have your bank house financed with a uh, with a local uh, 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 what was I trying to say here? Uh, but I mean, there is this, there is no. I, I have several friends that have gotten themselves in trouble, uh, and there's no judicial recourse because we're one of the very few states in the union that, that has a non judicial uh, uh, repossession, and, and which gives you no options, which gives you no outs. Yeah, well, I, I do know that we have a bank foreclosure process and a non judicial foreclosure process. Mm -hmm. Having said that, um, you know, there have been some abuses in the foreclosure process, and we read about them in the papers all the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, those been, those have been a relatively small percentage. Um, mm -hmm. The judicial process will slow down this process. We'll add a lot of costs to the process. Um, we already are facing judicial backlogs in almost every application. So to add another layer to the judicial system is ultimately a cost to the system. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'd have to add judges. We'd have to add, we're adding lawyers. We would also affect the net outcome of some of these foreclosures so that when there is a short sale or when there is a sale of the foreclosure process, a fair, fairly significant portion now will go into the legal system and won't end up into the homeowner's pocket if there's something left over after paying the bank. I don't know if it's the right answer to just throw out the baby with the bathwater. There is a legal remedy for these bad foreclosures, for these unjust foreclosures. You always do have a legal remedy with the courts. But to, to have a wholesale sale shift, I don't necessarily think is the right answer mm -hmm. on this process. We've had some, uh, a number of bills brought before our own house here in Georgia about tax issues. I mean, some people think we should do, a, uh, do away with after law and taxes. Some people think we should go to a sales tax uh, or some kind of across the board tax. Uh, how, you know, Florida runs off of sales taxes and do quite well. They don't have uh, they don't have income taxes in Florida. They're strictly sales tax. And um, uh, how do you what your how, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I've heard some of those bills, and I've heard some of uh, the opponents talk about you know dropping the personal income tax like Florida and and going to a fair or consumption or an ad valorem tax. The, I think some of those answers are a little overly simplistic. Uh, we raise about 44% of the budget via the state income tax, and the state income tax tops out at about 6%, but it moves fairly quickly. So the state income tax is right now about 6%. Um, if we were to drop that and go to a consumption or sales tax or an ad valorem tax, you're talking about getting into the 20s, 25% sales tax rate. We, in all the counties around the border, you know, the, the consumers would not shop here. They would cross the border and go into Alabama and start buying their goods and services there. And so you would, you would, over the course of a relatively short time, see the disappearance of your local retailer. So that may be an answer, but I think it's going to be a composite of a lot of different taxes. Maybe we can lower the state income tax and raise a little bit more revenue mm -hmm. in a ad valorem or or a consumption tax or a sales tax. But to throw out an answer that this is the answer is a little bit overly simplistic. I think you have to go into the, weed into the facts and data. I think you have to run the numbers. I have to think you have to talk about systematic, comprehensive tax reform so mm -hmm. that we can lower the tax burden on everyone in the state. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you cherry pick against the states that we border, Alabama, Florida, Tennessee, South Carolina, I think we make a mistake. I also think we're being a little bit short-sighted. At Millican & Company, one of the things that we always did is we benchmarked best practices. I think we have to broaden our thinking. The state used to be, in 2004, there was just an AJC article about this, the state used to be at the national average at all these quality of life issues, tax rates, uh, education levels, unemployment levels. Today we're at the bottom. We're at the bottom, we're, I think we're 45th in unemployment, we're in the very high 40s in education, and our tax burden hasn't lessened any on our citizens. Mm -hmm. I think we have to look at this seriously, and I think we have to come up with a total reform that is based on facts and data, not on sound bites, not on you know, 
nice things to say to the constituency that we then forget about and don't do anything about. In our judicial system, we're, you know, we've, we've, we've got it where we don't give judges much option when somebody comes before them. And uh, uh, we seem like uh, uh, we, wanna, uh, we, don't, we want to arrest the, um, the kids on the streets for making an issue, but, you know, uh, we want to arrest the person buying the drug, but we want the, we can leave the drug deal on the street. street. We, we've determined we spend, we, pro we spend more money on putting people in jail than any country in the world, but that obviously isn't working. Uh, uh, I see this when I grew up, you know, you got 16 year olds, you got a driver's license. Yeah. Now we've gotten half a dozen le levels of driver's license. I'm not so sure all that uh, is exactly good. I mean, I'm a big fan of you got to let kids grow up, grow up. We, we seem to have this p protection on like the driver's license. All right, I just a general issue. I mean, a kid on Halloween pushes over a mailbox. We're trying to make it a federal defense. Yeah, uh, I think the, uh, I, I'm especially concerned that we really seem to be very harsh on our younger 16, 17 year old population. Well, I think you're exactly. They're kids. Back off. I, I think you're exactly right. Um, and I, I watched some of your other interviews, and you use the example of the kid who puts a cherry bomb in a mailbox mm -hmm. and blows up a mailbox and then goes to jail. You know, clearly that act was more stupid than criminal. And, and you know, we all have made mistakes. The difference is when, when you and I were young, young men and made mistakes, we pretty much had someone in our town, an elder in our town, kind of grab us by the scruff of the neck and say, what are you thinking about, boy? And mm -hmm. straighten yourselves out. Mm -hmm. And I was talk, I've been talking to the judges and the lawyers around the, the district and they they feel this is a real issue. We are we are rushing people to judgment and we're putting people in jail needlessly. Now, some people do need to go to jail, but the the young man or woman who's made an act or had a first mistake that that again is more stupid than criminal. We need to have a little bit of latitude in our judicial process so that person doesn't become essentially a ward of the state. So we're not adding to our our, our incarceration bill, which is very, very significant, as you know. And then how does that cascade? That young man or woman comes out of prison in a certain amount of time, and they have that on their record. And I was talking to uh, you know, a judge and, and a defense attorney who was scratching their heads that then that person's future is significantly impaired. Yes. They don't have the possibility of getting a good job because they have a felony on their record. And so that you're, you're really committing people to not necessarily a lifetime of misery, but a lifetime of limited possibility because of one or two mistakes and that are more stupid than criminal. I think, I think our judges would like to have a little bit more latitude. I mm -hmm. think they would like to not incarcerate people so easily. Mm -hmm. I think they would like to have options where it doesn't affect someone for the rest of their life. So. Okay. Well, let's look, talk a little bit about ethics. You know, there's been several ethics bills before the House and Senate there. How, what, what's your feeling on that? You know, I feel that they're, they're needed. I think we need to have a, an ethics bill that gets through the House and gets through the Senate and then, then is signed by the governor. Uh, it seems every other week we're reading about another lawmaker who has had an ethical lapse. And I was at a debate and, and uh, you know, both of the guys who were there, not in this race, I was a viewer, not a participant, uh, and it was a couple of the House seats, and both of them said, you know, we're good guys, we kind of don't need this. And, and, you know, everybody is good and decent and honest until they appear in the AJC. I think we do need to have a real ethics bill that has teeth to it so that our, our, our voters and our constituents are being equally re represented. It's not just about the people with money and the lobbyists who, who have a say. Um, you know, clearly there have been more than one example of ethical lapses, and I think there needs to be a real bill uh, that has real teeth so that, you know, our lawmakers are there and, and representing their constituency and not a special interest group. Well, before we wrap it up here, do you have any particular subject you'd like to 
Well, oh. I'd, I'd like to say, first of all, Dennis, it's a, been a pleasure to meet well, you. I you. have really enjoyed uh, the stories we shared before mm -hmm. the interview. Uh, you know, I, I didn't know about your background, I, and I certainly didn't know about your dad. So that's, mm -hmm. for me, it's a real learning. I, I, I like, the part of the process I'm really liking is I'm getting to meet people I wouldn't have met. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing about things I wouldn't have necessarily known about. Um, you know, I, I'm running because, again, I'm not a politician. I'm running because I think we need real change. I think we need to get on with the business of fixing things and, and less on the business about talking about things. I think it's less about empty promises. I think it's about you know, wading in and, and being willing to do the hard work and, and really looking at you know being someone who will work with people who are seriously minded about fixing mm -hmm. our problems with the economy, our problems with lack of job creation, our problems with the education system. I think we I think we need to be serious about this. I, I, I think uh, you know it's it's no longer the time for idle empty promises. Uh, you know my business background I've been I have plenty of success and and most of that was attributed through hard work, but also through the mentorship and and through you know Roger Milliken the money he invested in me and Milliken and Company. <coughs> Roger Milliken insisted that every management associate would go through at least 40 hours of continuing education every year. And there was a cost to that, obviously, on the bottom line. He never viewed it as an expense. He viewed it as an investment. And the money that we talk about that are, it's part of our education process, and I think the number is about $7 billion, that's not an, in, that's not an expense. That's an investment. That's an investment in our community via the money, money we're spending on our young men and women. You know, do we need more effectiveness out of that? Certainly we do. Do we need more efficiency out of that? Certainly we do. We can't raise taxes. I mean, our, our citizens are already under, our citizens and our businesses are order, already under a, a tremendous tax burden. We've got to use, we've got to use our wherewithal to, to use our money better, to use it more wisely, to use it more effectively, to make tough choices. Um, so I think, you know, it's time that we make a tough choice here. We pick someone who's not been a politician. We pick someone who doesn't talk about promises, but instead wants to wade in, do the hard work, and uh, not spend the rest of my life at the Gold Dome. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, sir. William, pleasure. Th thank thank you, you for visiting us. Great. This has been Interviews to Suit, the Peacock TV production.